Uh, today, uh, we have Dr. Ponarelli, um, who's presenting on a topic that's probably near and dear to all of us, um, something we do every day, which is close the abdomen. Um, so, um, turn it over to Elizabeth. Good morning. Um, as most of you know, I haven't spent my entire training course here, so I've had the opportunity to work with most of you in this room, but not all of you. Um, and to start off, I know that this uh, is a presentation about a topic, but it's also sort of a presentation about us as people since we're about to move on into the world and, ah, that's not what I wanted. Um, and so uh, there's an American author who was quoted saying, it's always good to remember where you come from and celebrate it because to remember where you come from is part of where you're going. And for me, I've been quite a few places, and this is a little schematic showing you all where I've been and what I've done in the last nine years of my training. And I started in Colorado, and when I got bored of being there, I moved all the way to Chicago. I packed my geo and drove to Chicago and spent a few years doing what everybody does in between, doing anything we could do. And I went to medical school at Northwestern, and following that, I packed another moving truck and moved all the way to San Francisco, where I trained at the East Bay program for a year and a half as a prelim. And then I got a categorical spot back in Chicago. So there was another moving truck that moved all the way back to Chicago, where I trained at Mount Sinai for a year and a half. And it, during that time, I got the opportunity to do research. And the research ended up being all the way back in California at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, where I did three years of research. And then luckily, at the end of that, I made a very short trip up the coast to here, where I finished up my training at UC Davis. And where I'm going next remains to be seen. As some of you know, I'm applying for fellowship at this time. And uh, we'll see in the next few months what that holds for me. So why closing the abdomen? Well, if we need to know where we're going, we need to know where we've been. And one of the things that I've had the either privilege or sort of displeasure of, depending on the call night, is working at three major trauma centers and centers that see a lot of people that present with advanced disease process. And so this is something that was kind of pervasive anywhere I went was patients that had complex abdominal uh, pathology. And even though the, the pathogenesis in infants and children is different, a lot of the same issues arise when you look at closing the abdomen of patients that have lost domain or have uh, significant limitations to closing their abdomen. And in all of these places, I saw a lot of different ways to do things. Um, this is uh, the way that they were treating things in Oakland. We used something similar to this when I got to Chicago. This is kind of a variant on what we do here. I didn't have a great picture. And then, you know, some of these same vacuum uh, methodologies are used for infants with abdominal wall defects. And unfortunately, in addition to seeing a multitude of different ways to treat the, the open abdomen, I also saw a number of different complications. And they, they're similar, and they're all over, you know, Regardless of the way that you do things, you'll end up with large ventral hernias, you'll end up with intercutaneous fistulas, intraabdominal abscesses, and a number of other complications, um, regardless of the age of the patient or the reason that you open the abdomen in the first place. So in order to understand closing the abdomen, we have to figure out why we opened it in the first place. And open abdomens come with a variety of complications, and this was kind of what sparked my interest in this, was looking at the complications and trying to figure out uh, how we close the abdomen, whether we can mitigate any of these complications. And early on, um, you know, the patients have fluid loss and heat loss, and they can develop the fistulas and abscesses. And then later on, and I'll show you the, the time progression because it's really interesting to see, you know, they end up with these large ventral hernias that either can't be closed or they cause significant respiratory difficulties when, with closing them. And, um, and so there's a multitude of factors that you have to think about when you're talking about opening the abdomen and then later on closing it. So the questions that I was thinking about are, how do we manage the open abdomen at this juncture? How did we manage it in the past? And can we improve upon any of those things to decrease our complication rates? So it actually started with peritonitis. And when I started training, this was something we did more for trauma. And so I figured it started with trauma. But it actually started with peritonitis. And the first person to describe in, in literature doing surgical treatment for peritonitis was Kirshner, and that happened in 1926. And up until then, they had this sense that people had intra-abdominal sepsis, but nobody was going in and exploring them and washing them out and finding out what was going on in there. And so he reported a series of patients where he showed the mortality from intra-abdominal sepsis, and he could decrease that to about 60%. Now, he wasn't leaving the abdomen open at this time. He was going in, doing surgery, and then closing everybody up. 
but that was the beginning of surgical treatment for peritonitis. And then in 1940, in the middle of World War II, Ogilvy started leaving abdomens open. And he basically was using dressing supplies. So he would cut up pieces of cotton, like canvas cloth, like the stuff you make tents out of. And he would, he would basically put it in the middle there, kind of like the earliest form of mesh that you can imagine. And he would just sew that to the fascia with basically no planned take back. So these patients that had had um, war wounds that where they'd had bowel perforation, he would do that so that he could, in theory, <clears throat> wash the abdomen out through the canvas. And then the next thing that he did was just to um, leave the abdomen open so that he could wash it out later if necessary, but not necessarily planned. And he would um, soak gauze and Vaseline. And the skin was actually closed. They, they make an analogy between what he used in elastoplast, but basically it was tape. And so if you can imagine like, you know, all the fluid that usually spills out of these abdomens, how great a dressing this must have been at that time. But that was where, that was where it all began. And until, you know, about 1979, that was about all we knew about leaving the abdomen open. For 30 years, um, there's really no significant literature reports of people leaving the abdomen open. And I presume that people were doing it in the 50s and 60s for various indications. Um, but there's nothing reported until Steinberg in 1979 reported putting gauze packs in and wires. And this actually looks like the patient's eviscerating, but these are the gauze packs right here. And they're going underneath these wires. And he would, in about 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours, he would take them back. And all he would do was take the packs out and close the wires. Um, and so you essentially had wires sitting right next to bowel, depending on how much momentum the patient had. But he still reported a mortality of 7%, albeit in 14 patients. But he reported a very low mortality in these patients. And so that was a pretty significant finding, because <clears throat> at the time of Ogilvy, we had only really taken that mortality from 60% to 50 or 40%, and now he was reporting it down to 7. And in the next subsequent years, um, Duff actually had a really interesting idea. He decided he's not going to close the abdomen at all. And he basically depended on uh, the fibrinous adhesions that form between the bowel to keep the patient from eviscerating. And he would just uh, basically put gauze packs over the top of it and then and then just leave it there and just kind of hope that the patient didn't like get out of bed and, and everything spilled out or something. Um, but uh, his mortality was also low. And Mitani also uh, described a similar series where he did open peritoneal drainage. He left drains, like drain tubes in the abdomen and he would flush them out um, every day and the, and the effluent would come into gauze packs and he would take those off. His theory, though, because um, when Steinberg and Duff reported, they actually started reporting the first uh, intercutaneous fistula complications with these. He thought, well, if you divert proximally, then um, the rest of the bowel can't form a fistula, which was erroneous, but that's what he did. Um, and with his small numbers, he also had a low mortality. But of course, as all things, if there's too few patients presented, it was too good to be true. And so... Um, Anderson in 1983, which really wasn't that much longer after this, tried to recreate these same results. And frequently, when you recreate the same results from that landmark study, they don't turn out quite as landmark as they were originally. And his mortality was actually 60% in patients that he closed. He actually compared 10 patients with open abdomens and 10 patients with closed abdomens. And the mortality of the open abdomen patients was 60%, which is going all the way back pre-Ogilvy, 60%. So not terribly good news. Um, and he was actually reporting a mortality of 33% in historical controls that had just been operated on and then closed immediately. And in his, um, in his series, the most important finding was that nine patients of the open abdomen group never actually got closed at all, and that the mortality in that set of patients was almost 90%. And so it was our first clue to that, to the fact that leaving the abdomen open sort of permanently was really never going to be um, a definitive definitive management. And then there was a whole group of other studies that happened in the 1980s. Um, and all of them showed a really high mortality and really high intercutaneous fistula rates. Um, and so it was kind of thought at the end of the 1980s that that was, that was it. There was not going to be much open abdominal treatment um, because of the complication rates. But in 19, between 1986 and 1992, there was this huge explosion of innovation. Because um, if you pose a problem to people, they will try to come up with an answer, as uh, we well know. Um, and so in 1986, um, they proposed what they call the sandwich techniques. 
and they put a Marlex mesh with nothing underneath it, just overlying the bowel. Um, these were actually more frequently used for irrigation than suction, even though this looks kind of like our, what we use as the modern vacuum pack. Um, these were actually used more for irrigation um, than suction, but they would irrigate in and then suck the fluid back out again, and they would just cover it over with plastic. So no gauze packs, no bowel bags, nothing, just Marlex mesh on bowel, and you can imagine how great that turned out. Um, and then somebody figured, well, why do we keep sewing and re-sewing to the fascia every time we go in, so let's just put in a zipper. And they literally fashioned a Marlex mesh that had a zipper in it. And you could then go in the next day for your take back and just unzip the patient, wash everything out, and zip them back up again. Um, and this was a pretty novel idea at the time. But again, you also had mesh sitting on uncovered bowel, which you know it wasn't the zipper that was the problem. It was really the mesh that was the problem. So it was a nice idea. Um, but it ended up having the same complications with the intercutaneous fistulas. Um, uh, our friends down in Colombia um, developed what we call the Bogota bag, which basically involved taking a two-liter uh, a two-liter saline bag and cutting it to the shape of the defect and just sewing it into the fascia. And it's interesting to me when I when I found out that this had actually started in 1989, because when I started training in 2007, this is what we were doing at in Oakland, um, and probably a combination of resource utilization and speed. But you know, we would. Put uh, sometimes put vacuum assisted devices over the top of this, but this was our this was our bow bag was the two liter saline bag, um, which was kind of amazing to me that that was still in in vogue at that time. Um, and then you know what's better than zippers? Velcro. It was the 1990s, and so uh, Whitman basically created um, the Velcro patch where you could um, incrementally. And the one thing about the Velcro patch that was better than the zipper was that you could incrementally close it, right? You can tighten your shoes tighter every day if you've got Velcro, but if they zip, they're always the same size. So you could, um, basically take this and it, there's little burrs on here, you know, just like a piece of Velcro and you would slide this piece of Velcro underneath the fascia on that side and then put that one a little bit tighter and then just cut off the extra as you went down and down and down and down. Um, which again, really great idea as far as incrementally closing the abdomen, but you basically had a piece of mesh that was sitting overlying the bowel. And so um, you ended up having the same complications. And then one of my favorites, which I've also done this um, in various training environments, was somebody just decided, this is all way too expensive and I'm gonna take the patient back tomorrow anyway, so just give me 30 towel clamps and I'm just gonna clip the skin closed all the way down. Um, and frequently with nothing underneath, no packing, no nothing. Um, and they would just put towel clamps on. And I've actually done that a number of times very, at various training programs um, as well. And sometimes cover it with a, a big piece of IOBAN or sometimes not, just leave the towel clamps on. Um, and actually the results from the towel clamps were surprisingly good um, compared to the rest of these because you didn't have any sort of foreign body sitting on your bowel. You just basically had skin, the underside of the dermis, which wasn't too terribly bad. So in the 1990s, so it was all peritonitis up until then, believe it or not, all of those innovations were generated on the thought that when you open the abdomen for peritonitis, you needed to go back and do repeated washouts to get um, source control of the sepsis. And there was a, a series of data that um, basically went by the wayside, but it, it w involved taking cultures, daily cultures, to see if there was still bacterial load in there. And <clears throat> it didn't end up being prognostic for the patient at all, whether there was bacteria in there or not, which is why it didn't become relevant long term, but up until basically 1993, um, <clears throat> trauma wasn't really involved in this whole process. Uh, between the 70s and the 90s, there were a lot of reports of um, packing for hemorrhage, um, but these were all complicated, again, by infections because the packs were frequently left in. There was no planned reoperation time, so they could be left in for weeks or, you know, um, days depending on the, the surgeon's preference. And so all of that blood acting as a, a good nidus for infection in an open field would cause significant intra-abdominal um, infections. And they would also um, adhere to the bowel and then you'd try and take the packs back out again and you'd end up with tears in the bowel and intercutaneous fistula. Um, so in 1993 was like the first time that we got the damage control laparotomy. Um, which is really sort of landmark because the damage control laparotomy, whether it's done for trauma or whether it's done for general surgery indications, is actually the primary indication for having an open abdomen these days. Um, peritonitis in and of itself is no longer an indication 
and we know well that we can leave the patient with some intra-abdominal um, infection, and we can now use IR and other things to mitigate those complications. Um, so this was the first time they talked about damage control. And it happened uh, in mostly in patients with major vascular injuries. And the, the great thing about this trial was he randomized all these patients um, either to what he called the damage control, that's DC, or definitive laparotomy. So he either left them open or closed them the same day. And the goal was to prevent what he called the fatal triad, which was coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. And so he would take them to the OR, <clears throat> do, this do this damage control surgery, and he basically saw similar survival rates overall, which was great. But what he saw that was more important was that he saw a significant survival improvement in patients with major vascular and visceral injuries. So um, <clears throat> for those patients that didn't have major injuries, they basically were kind of neither nor on whether you needed to close them or not. But if you had done a major vascular uh, repair or you had stapled off a piece of bowel and left them you know, in discontinuity, then they did you know, significantly better um, by not having the definitive surgery done at that time and being sent back um, to their ICUs for for resuscitation. <clears throat> and during that same time, there was a big discussion about intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome. And that, <clears throat> sorry, that phrase, abdominal compartment syndrome, really wasn't even coined until the late 1980s. And so there was this understanding that things would swell up and patients would have bad physiology, but nobody actually quantified that um, until the mid-1980s, where uh, actually, it started with aortic aneurysm repairs, and they started checking intra-abdominal pressure as an indication for take-backs for uh, patients that had had aneurysm repairs, uh, presumably due to, to you know, bowel edema from significant resuscitation and things like that. Um, and in 1995, um, Schein re reported the first therapeutic laparotomy for abdominal compartment syndrome in a patient that had not had surgery before. So they were taking back patients that had already had surgery for abdominal compartment syndrome, but nobody was cutting open virgin abdomens just for that until 1995. Um, and in 1998, we actually got some uh, solid data showing that once you decompress the abdomen, you can see a, um, an improve, improvements in lung compliance and decreased intra-abdominal pressure and all these other things. Um, so the late 1990s to the 2000s, we had continued innovation and an increasing awareness of complications. <coughs> Keeping in mind that at the, sa at the same time, there was a huge development in the types of mesh and the um, types of materials that you could close the abdomen with. And so um, uh, a lot of patients were having these damage control laparotomies with temporary abdominal closures and then were later being closed with mesh. This was in the early 1990s and then be, being allowed to granulate over, and there were descriptions of skin grafts, and some patients, depending on the size of the defect, would be able to granulate in um, from the edges on their own. But the problem with those, all of those was that you had these interocutaneous and interatmospheric fistulas, and the interatmospheric fistula being the most concerning. Um, so even though you were able to keep the abdominal contents in, you had these pieces of bowel that were eroding it into the surface. And even in the cases where the abdomen was allowed to be closed or was, was capable of being closed, you still had an intercutaneous fistula rate of about 5%, even when you closed the abdomen, just because, I guess, of all the, the time that you'd been in there manipulating things and the um, potential for uh, intra-abdominal infection. And so this was sort of one of those things that when we were on rounds at various places and you had an abdomen that looked similar to one of these, you'd have to kind of look at the output and what was on the dressing and say, is that succus? Is, is that a hole in the bowel? And it happened relatively frequently. Interior atmospheric fistulas were still at a rate of about 25%. So about a quarter of the patients that were left to granulate over the bowel would have uh, what was essentially a pretty morbid and sometimes fatal complication. And so it sparked, and I could give an entire talk just on this, um, an, enti a set, an entirely different set of innovations that involved the creative use of ostomy appliances and, uh, you know, um, baby bottle nipples over the fistula and wound vac usage and putting drains in things and trying to keep the space clean. And even to this day, we still don't have uh, a terribly good solution for either the intercutaneous or the interatmospheric fistula. So anybody who wants to get on the forefront figure this out and, uh, and somebody will be talking about you at Grand Rounds in 10 years.
Um, and then <clears throat> the other issue was the fascial non-closure. And the fascial non-closure rate in the 1990s was still like 25%. So a quarter of the people that you tried to close, you take them back, take them back, take them back, still couldn't get their fascia closed, and you'd have to close them with the mesh. And, um, and then you'd end up with 25% of those getting enterocutaneous fistulas. So you're kind of creating this cascade of complications. Um, and in the best case scenario, you'd put some sort of vacuum device on it. You'd you know, get a skin graft. It would granulate. But then what do we do with all the hernias? Because those, a lot of the things that we figured out from mesh was that using uh, non-absorbable mesh was a huge nidus for infection. Um, and this was all back before we had microporous mesh. But um, so most of these patients were being closed with, with absorbable mesh. And three, six months later, that mesh was gone. And there was absolutely nothing containing their abdominal viscera inside their abdomen. And again, I could give an, an entire talk on, uh, on what do we do with the hernias. Um, but that, to this day, remains a, a huge complication of this. And then just other complications rates. The intra-abdominal abscess rate um, still varied from about 10 to 20%. And the mortality was still about 25% for any patient that had had their abdomen open electively. The one thing that we never really considered up until the early 2000s was what happens to all these patients with the open abdomen? Because you say, well, you know, they have these complication rates, and, but they're alive. And so that was a huge win. But what kind of life were they living? And so um, Cheatham studied in 2004, gave the short form 36, which is a measure of quality of life and mental health, to 30 patients who were discharged with open fascia. Um, and at the time of the surgery, 11 of them were still without fascial closure, and 19 of them had been closed. And so he could compare patients who had had, who had, had their abdomen open but then had had it closed in the interim to patients that had their abdomens remained open, either because they were told that they couldn't have them or they just hadn't had the surgery yet. And when the patients had their fascia open with these usually large ventral hernias, um, <clears throat> they had huge changes in their mental health level. A lot of them weren't working. They had depression. They had perceived... Um, alterations in their health, so they thought they were much sicker than they were. And then, uh, miraculously, once they had their abdomen closed, even though it, they'd had maybe a year or more of having it open, all of those things were mitigated. And once their fascia was back intact and their ventral hernia was gone, about 78% of those patients were able to re-enter the workforce, and they didn't show any significant signs of depression. And so it, <clears throat> it raised the issue that really getting the abdomen closed is a huge, huge um, issue for patients um, in their functionality after they leave the ICU and after they leave the hospital. So in the 1990s, I've shown a couple pictures of the wound back, we started with the vacuum pack, and this is kind of the early vacuum pack. And the difference between this and the sandwich technique was that there's a bowel bag underneath all of this. There's a basically more or less a Bogota bag, but usually softer plastic material, goes over the bowel and then packs and then drains and then more packs and then usually a large piece of plastic or, or oxide or whatever. Um, and the vacuum pack started in 1995. And then, of course, they figured, hey, we've got all these wound vac supplies. We've been using wound vacs during that same period of time, so people started using traditional wound vac supplies on it. But you couldn't keep away somebody's desire to make money, and so uh, KCI developed the specific open abdomen vac um, called the Abthera in 2009, which basically does uh, functionally the same thing as all of these two, but it has um, some added benefits in that there's suction between the bowel bag and then there's you know this over the top of it, um, which is a, a different kind of sponge and it's supposed to um, you know, improve uh, evacuation of fluid and get less clogged than the black sponges we use for, um, for wounds. And then in 2001, 2007, and 2008, we saw the development of the dynamic retention sutures. It started out, these little tubes here are actually like, um, uh, sometimes they're red rubber catheters, sometimes they are Penrose drains, but basically a plastic bolster, and then just a retention suture. Um, and, you know, it's funny because this in 2001 was like, reported as this, as this like incredibly novel idea, but then it's like almost exactly the same thing that was happening in 1979 with like the wires. And the only difference is that this is a bowel bag right here, underneath here. Um, 
and then the retention sutures, and then, well, and then packs and then retention sutures over the top of it. So it's really kind of the same thing being recycled all over again with just a few tweaks between 1979 and 2001. Um, and these were all individual. They were individual sutures that would go through. So you'd have 20 sutures going across your abdomen. Um, and then in 2007, they figured, well, let's just put like one or two in and just keep tightening those because um, that would be easier. And then once the abdomen's uh, fully closed, you can go in and do the definitive closure. Um, and then in 2008, of course, um, somebody needed to make money off of this. So they developed uh, the ABRA. Uh, for open abdomens, which is, my, which is the uh, Spanish word for open abra. Um, and they basically did the same thing, and they, they, you can now click these sutures down into the, um, where's my pointer? These little plastic devices, these are, these are the sutures here, and they have um, clickable advancements, and you can basically close the abdomen incrementally over time. And then people went and said, well, what's better than one, two? So, they went back, and this is back to the sandwich technique again, and they decided, well, let's put in a mesh and then cover it with a vac, which they presented in 2012, I think, as being a totally novel and new idea, and that had actually been presented way back in you know, 1985. Um, so I thought that was kind of funny. But the better thing about the way that they're doing this now is that we have meshes that can be opposed to the bowel. So unlike back when we were just laying Marlex over the top of the bowel, um, these are... Uh, microporous, um, frequently absorbable meshes on the bowel and then covered with a non-absorbable um, mesh over the top to maintain abdominal domain. Or you could use like the maximum amount of money and you could use the Abra and the Abthera in union um, with retention sutures and a wound back at the same time. So how do you pick a temporary closure? Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Um, you can use towel clips, you can use a Bogota bag, you can use mesh, you can use these zippers. The Whitman patch actually has been um, advanced uh, in its technology and it's been recreated um, to uh, have a, a protective lining on the underside of the downside of the Velcro. So actually you don't have as many intercutaneous fistulas with the Whitman patch as you did when it was originally presented. You have a number of vacuum assisted, whether you just do the vac pack or you do the abthera, and then these retention sutures. And so there were all these small studies all through the 90s, 70 patients, 22 patients, 15 patients, and everybody saying, look at all my amazing results. But it wasn't actually until like 2009 that we got the first uh, systematic review taking all these closure types and saying, okay, which ones are actually the best? Um, and knowing the complications that arise from not being able to get the fascia closed, one of the most important things to figure out was what was the best fascial closure technique. Um, and in this study in 2009, actually the Whitman patch at that time um, was the best fascial closure was the best fascial closure technique. They had a, four studies that looked at the Whitman patch, and they had a 90% closure rate. Now, keeping in mind that those studies were relatively small, so the number of patients that were included in this 15 studies that used a vacuum pack was about tenfold higher. So um, the fascial closure rate for the Whitman patch is probably not 90%. It's probably closer to this. So that was a sample, you know, that was a, a power error in that. Um, but you could see we were getting pretty good fascial closure rates, the vac um, being just slightly higher than the vacuum pack. But then again, going back to the, the question of what's your fistula rate um, and the zipper hands down being the worst um, and followed by, by these other, it's in the Whitman patch. Fistula rate, I think, in this series was about 2%. And the, uh, the next major review came out in 2015. And in this one, they basically looked at the, those last two technologies I talked about, which was the negative pressure wound therapy, which was any sort of vac. So a vac pack, an Abthera, KCI, whatever you wanted to use. As long as you were using a vacuum, that counted. And then they looked at it with fascial traction and without fascial traction. And so they actually saw the highest fascial closures rate using a wound vac along with fascial traction. Um, and whether that was a mesh, a non-absorbable mesh to keep loss of domain, or whether that was fascial traction sutures, um, those combined uh, were about 500 patients and they saw a closure rate of about 73%. Um, and then the fistula rate um, actually was significantly decreased even from a wound vac alone, which I thought was really interesting. But then when you look at the, the 
uh, time to closure, which they also presented in this study, you actually gained a couple of days um, if you used the, the dynamic retention sutures. And so I think that contributes to the fistula rate is just simply that you got the abdomen closed sooner and so you had um, fewer washouts and fewer inflammatory stimuli going on in the abdomen. So just for a brief review, indications for an open abdomen. Basically today, those that cannot be closed due to bowel edema or abdominal compartment syndrome or those that should not be closed because you're basically planning a take back for damage control, um, for sepsis, not so much these days, but um, or for bowel ischemia to kind of take a second look and see what's left um, and survived. And so what we've learned over the years from all of these innovations and all of the uh, variety of ways that we close the abdomen. The one thing that we did learn is you should really re-explore every 48 to 72 hours because if it gets any longer than that, you get an increased development in um, uh, uh, the fiber and adherence between the bowel and it's a lot harder to wash them out. And you also get an increase in the abdominal abscess rate. Um, there was one study that looked at uh, timing for closing the abdomen and if you can get them closed in less, in seven days or less, um, they actually have a significant decrease in their complication rate. So that should be the goal if you're ever kind of doing open abdomen therapy is not to have them open for longer than a week. Um, there was a, a point in the mid-1990s where we figured out the patients didn't need to be intubated anymore. That was actually kind of a landmark thing was they started extubating patients and just kind of leaving them um, with their fascia wide open and complex vacuum dressings all over the place. And patients actually did surprisingly well just with pain control. Um, and they didn't need to be sedated or paralyzed in order to tolerate that. Um, one of the studies looked at um, fluid management and renal failure and uh, uh, acute renal insufficiency um, related to uh, pre-renal states. And they found that the wound back was a much better way to quantify what's coming out of the patient so that you can uh, change and modulate their fluid shifts. So regardless of what you're doing for a fascial closure device, um, adding a wound back to that will help you determine what the patient's fluid status is. And the biggest thing we learned overall was don't play don't, don't play, place mesh on bowel, which we obviously learn all the time now. But uh, back when this all started, it seemed like a good idea and um, didn't, didn't really turn out that way. So going back to this, when you've been around and you've been as many places as I have, it's not as simple to end your grand rounds presentation with a thank you. Um, one of the benefits of living in so many places is that you end up with lots and lots of friends in lots of places around uh, the country. And uh, I'd like to say a special thank you to all my friends here in Sacramento who you know, welcomed me uh, into their lives for the short period of time that I was here. Um, and uh, of course, to our kickball team, even though we lost. Um, the other person is my husband who continually uh, doesn't seem to balk every time I tell him we're packing up a moving van and moving across the country um, and uh, has been been by my side for a long time. I appreciate his support, the support of my family um, who mostly lives in Colorado but are always available for the, oh my god, I had the worst call night phone call, um, which is fantastic. And um, lastly, when you've been training at an as many places as I've been training, you end up with a lot of really uh, unique and amazing mentors. And so I'd like to thank them as well for the path um, that they've helped me pave through my career and going forward. So you go out and practice next year, and you have an open abdomen, and now you're going to manage that open abdomen. What's your, what's your, what's going to be how you're going to manage that open abdomen? So in all three of the places that I've trained, they've used really just sort of like the isolated vacuum therapy, whether that's like in uh, Chicago, we use the, the Abthera, the actual KCI system, and here we use the backpack. Um, and it's not great to go out on your own the first year and like start doing things that you're not trained to do. But I have to say the data that um, is included in using the fascial retention sutures in addition to the um, VAC therapy definitely makes me want to explore that. And if you know I had a senior level partner that was familiar with that, that would be something that I'd be interested in doing because it does seem to actually um, get a higher closure rate and to, and to improve um, some of those complications that happen from leaving the abdomen open. So that'd be one thing I'd like to learn more about is as how to use those fascial retention sutures along with a vacuum therapy. Yeah. 
Yes. It's a great summary of uh, three decades worth of uh, one of the you know, real albatross problems in general surgery. Um, what you, one thing you didn't mention, I'm curious about the what you're reading uh, enlightened you on in this part is the, the incidence probably of having an open abdomen probably has gone down significantly in the last 10 years than it was 30 years ago. The efforts of trying to That's an interesting question, and actually, I probably could have answered that from the, the research that I read, because a lot of them were like, you know, they had reviewed X number of trauma patients at their institution, and they had the percentages of patients that had had an open abdomen. I just didn't um, collate that data. So, But off the top of my head, just kind of, I've been in training for a decade almost, and so I have this sense of like where things were when I started training in 2007 and where things are now. And I definitely think we manage fewer open abdomens now than we did before. Um, but that also may have changed based on the, the composition of the patient population, because where I started was a huge, heavy, penetrating trauma um, kind of environment, and we have less of that here. So I don't know if that has more to do with the patient population than it does with advances in resuscitation. Um, but I think that is a really interesting question um, and seeing if, you know, eventually if we can actually manage the patients better in a critical care setting, could we get away from having open abdomens altogether? Your work is on biologic matches, bridging. We know they don't have a lot of potency, but they go through and might be yeah, and so again, like such a huge topic, and I could give like an entire grand rounds just on mesh. Um, but some of the new things that they're doing with mesh that are really interesting is they have what they're calling absorbable meshes, but that are really, really long term. So they don't actually absorb for like six to nine months. And with, when you figure that your planned ventral hernia repair is going to be at about a year, that could really get you um, almost to the point where you could close the abdomen. Um, so you'd have essentially an absorbable mesh, but that was functioning as a permanent mesh. The biggest problem is that uh, macroporous meshes cause more enterocutaneous fistulas, and microporous meshes get infected. And nobody's really figured out what the answer to that is um, as of yet. Um, it'd be great to get something that was macroporous, but that didn't erode into the bowel. And we just we don't have it yet. Um, or, if, or if we do, I haven't, I haven't found the literature that, that describes it. Um, but I think if you look at the, the experience overall, this pendulum just kind of swings. So like we started with non-absorbable mesh because that's what we had. That was the only mesh we had. And then it swung and they said, well, let's put in the absorbable mesh because it'll have a lower infection rate. And it did, except you had these huge ventral hernias. And so now they're swinging back and saying, well, let's put in something that will actually hold the fascia together and prevent loss of domain, except, you know, then you have the easy fistula rate and you have to remove the bowel bag eventually. And... So it's kind of hard to say, like, how innovation will let that swing um, in the future. I can't help but follow up on Dr. Jerkovich's observation. I think the critical care part of this is important. And if there's one time when a patient can benefit from the use of a swan dance catheter, this is the patient that can use it. Where you have to understand Agreed. Okay.
Juan will let you express yourself. Dr. Schatz? Go ahead and comment. This is not a question. It's okay. Yeah, there are studies that looked at, you know, um, and actually that was another kind of swing was that, you know, we thought, oh, these patients all have to be intubated because who's going to tolerate having their abdomen open with this gigantic, you know, appliance of whatever sort on it. And then the other thing that we, we realized later on is that these patients that have their abdomens open for a long time actually, you know, need nutrition started early. Um, and even though they may have an ileus, they need TPN started. But a surprising number of them actually can have enteral nutrition with their abdomens open, which I found really surprising um, that you could actually feed a patient that had, um, you know, their fashion not closed. But as far as like, you know, how do you control for the fact that you're removing protein rich fluid and you're basically causing, you know, hypoalbuminemic state so that you have more fluid rushing into the bowel wall. I'm not sure that we have that down. The, the downside of not having the vac on is just that all the fluid goes all over the place. Um, and it actually macerates the skin. It macerates the the fascia and um, some of the studies described how their fascial closure devices, whether it was a Bogota bag or whatever, would fall apart because of the of the fluid that was coming out of the abdomen all the time. And that was, you know, I don't know if there's a really good answer for that just yet. Dr. Kokenar? Thank you very much.